So there's a lot of history to summarize here, um, having sort of just spoken about the Red Queen problem and things like this. Um, but in Chapter 3, in Dinan, Nugent and Patterson, again by Ben Rosamond, we find presented a fairly synthetic version of a very different, very unique, very original take on European integration theory than the ones that we've seen asserted by the mainstream accounts we've been looking at up to this point in time in the course. Uh, Rosamond's story is much more grounded in the Red Queen's dilemma uh, than the other theories we've been looking at, right? Because it recognizes, Rosamond's approach recognizes um, capitalism's constant struggle to walk on this tightrope to um, respond to its ever and ongoing economic crisis without creating a political crisis. So by this account, the two world wars were, of course, driven by disagreements. Um, the two world wars were driven by disagreements between the major powers about how to divvy up, divide up the spaces that were available globally for colonial expansion. In other words, they were actually wars of interstate rivalry. Um, the empires were all ultimately capitalist in nature, and they were trying to find new markets, cheap raw materials, cheap labor overseas to help them offset their economic crisis. Um, the elites of the European countries after World War II realizing that they were walking on this tightrope, understood that basically the people were exhausted and that they were now confronted by a massive challenge. Insofar as the main costs of the two world wars um, were infrastructural and the infrastructures of the European powers were now in ruins. And it was going to be hard for those governments to appear to be capable to their citizens of providing basic welfare. In other words, on that tightrope that we've been talking about, it was more apparent, it was going to be, because of the weakness of the European economies, it was going to be hard for the governments to demonstrate to their voters that they were walking more on the democratic side of the equation than they were on the economic side of the equation. So, you know, as we've discussed before in this class, George Marshall had written home after World War II on the risk of European citizens voting for communism. Uh, as Ben Rosamond argues in his chapter on page 35, invasion, defeat, and occupation had left many of their governments eventually uh, clinging in exile to the assertion of a dubious legitimacy. Um, so, Dubious, dubious legitimacy should be our kind of watchword here. The European states were weak. They were too weak individually on their own, that is to say, to fix the system. And they were facing this legitimacy crisis. The citizens of their countries were aware that they were kind of on the wrong side of this tightrope. Um, so in order to restore the health of European capitalism, they were going to have to work together. They were going to have to coordinate their efforts. And this was something that had never happened before in the history of Europe, right? It was unprecedented. Up to that point in time, the great powers in Europe had always been in a position of rivalry with each other. They had resolved their crises by competing with each other, sometimes and frequently even in, on the battlefield. But capitalism, the logic of capitalism, must be obeyed. So capitalism has to be obeyed. And of course, the reason why that's so is because, you know, if, and what we mean by that is if the profits can't be generated, you know, if the markets can't be found to sell things, that allow us to sell things to people, then the profits won't be made. If the profits won't be made, the businesses will go bankrupt. And 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 what we saw in the Great Depression was was you know very very much close to a, a death of capitalism. Um, so capitalism has to be kept healthy if it is to survive. It has to be able to survive its internal tendency towards crisis all the time. 
And that's just a historical fact. That's not a, I'm not, I'm not making a political observation there one way or another, just that, that capitalism has to be able to uh, find what, what, what Wolfgang Streak calls a spatio-temporal fix, right? Um, it has to be able to um, find a way to organize space and time um, globally so that profits can continue to be generated. Um, so now then, paradoxically, um, in a historically unprecedented manner, the states of Europe were going to join their sovereignty together, or as we sometimes call it, to pool their sovereignty in order to be able to uh, find efficiencies, uh, to open up their markets to each other, um, to remove the tariffs at their borders, to create a common market. And if they didn't do this, if they were not going to heed the, 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 the logical need for this move, um, then their economies would fail. And if their economies failed, the populations would likely rise up and out of poverty and out of desperation, they would likely choose communism. So I hope what I'm saying here doesn't sound too alarmist uh, or political. It's not meant to be that. I'm simply saying what many American observers at the time, including George Marshall of the Marshall Plan, uh, observed, which is that if, if capitalism couldn't work, if capitalism couldn't put money and food in money in people's pockets and food in people's bellies, then they're not going to stick around. They're going to find a better system for them. So this, this is you know, do or die moment, so to speak, right? Um, and so the solution to this crisis at this particular moment, anyway, I mean, again, the crisis is always there, right? It's just sometimes it reaches a crescendo. And the solution to this particular crescendo, which, you know, again, was the Great Depression and World War II, was called embedded liberalism, what John Ruggie calls embedded liberalism. So what is that? It's a system of government that is capitalist insofar as uh, it is a liberalized or um, deregulated or free movement of goods and services. But the ability of capital to dictate the development in society, to rearrange society as it did, say, for example, in the uh, enclosures in, when, when the peasants were kicked off the land, uh, in the 19th century, in the in the 18th century, that ability of capital is checked, is held in check by a logic of domestically negotiated social purposes. In other words, democratically negotiated social ends. And that's a quote from Rosamond. In my language, I would say a socially aware or socially sensitive politics. And the critical point um, is that this is not something that was just happening in Europe. It was happening uh, in the United States as well. The United States was very committed to this. And so the United States and the European powers came together at a conference called the Bretton Woods Conference after World War II, or right at the end of World War II, to envision to create an architecture in their minds uh, and on paper and in legislation um, for a global implementation of this embedded liberal logic, right? A, a liberalism, an embedded liberalism that would permit capitalism to develop and grow, but in a way that did not fundamentally buck um, this need for domestically negotiated social purposes. So the United States critically here, you know, is doing this not because the United States is socialist, even though some of these things today would be what Fox News would call socialism. That's not the point at all. The point was that if these things weren't done, Europe would become communist. So capitalism had, they had to find a moderated version of capitalism. So the idea, says Rosamond, is that these activities would be, as he says again and again in the piece, market making. And personally, I find this to be a crucial term. The free market system had collapsed after the war. 
and it was now politically at risk too. So this is the paradox, right? The ideology of capitalism tends to say that the government shouldn't interfere in the market because that is socialist. But here, historically, the government is having to interfere in the market because the market is broken. And if it doesn't interfere in the market, right, the people are going to quit believing in it. So this, what's sometimes called les 30 glorieuses in French, the, the 30 glorious years. These are, this is the golden age of capitalism after World War II. Um, the thing about it is, it was a highly interventionist moment in the history of the global economy. It's, it's one of the most interventionist moments in human history, if you want to go there, right? Um, but our parents' generation, the baby boomers, um, were born in this, right? They were born in the 40s and the 50s, maybe the 60s. My parents certainly were. And um, for them, they grew up thinking this was normal right? They thought the golden age of capitalism, the 30 glorious years, was normal, default, regular, that this is the way capitalism looked. And that this suspension of the normal rules of capitalism then, although they didn't see it as a suspension of the rules necessarily, but what they weren't seeing, much as a fish doesn't know it's in water, um, what they weren't seeing was that actually what was going on here was an unprecedented era of growth, catch-up growth, if you will, growth that raised the living standards of people all over Europe, such that household consumption really began to, to grow and catch up with that of America. It was really quite amazing. America had been, you know, much further ahead. Uh, the life of the average American consumer was way more advanced and developed um, at that time. And so for the Europeans to be catching up at this speed was very impressive. And one of the main ingredients here uh, was that the political parties in power, whether they were left-wing or whether they were right-wing, were all basically committed to this spatio-temporal fix, this basic idea of, of, a, of a capitalism that was checked by domestically negotiated social purposes, as we keep saying, um, or by the principle in Ben Rosamond's terms of market making. Um, so they were all committed to this plan. They were willing to be the intermediaries, as Peter Mayer argues, uh, between society and the economy. Um, they were kind of like a marriage counselor between the two, um, constantly trying to figure out what society wants from the economy and what the economy wants from society and to find some kind of happy medium between the two. So this all went on for a good period of time. And um, thus, we call it the era of Bretton Woods, which, as we've discussed before, died in the early 1970s. It died because it succumbed primarily to what we call stagflation, which itself was the result of the massive costs of the Vietnam War and the catching up of foreign competitor states with the United States of America, the result of which being that the United States could no longer afford to pay for embedded liberalism, certainly not on a global basis. And that meant that because the marriage counselor, if you will, could no longer intervene in the relationship, that the more dominant of the two parties is going to win out. And that, of course, is the logic of the markets. So stagflation then, right, which, which we've described previously as, um, you know, a, a, an economy that's not growing, but which is importing more expensive goods and services because it has to, i.e. oil, uh, because once the United States could no longer be the marriage counselor, what happens is that oil producing countries start to say, I uh, hear, you know, we can go out on our own here and they start to increase the price of oil. So it means that the very sort of underperforming in the 1970s um, economies of the Western world are now not only underperforming, but they're starting to deal with dramatically increased increases, uh, the, excuse me, dramatically increased prices of of uh, of, of oil. Um, and and the stagflation basically meant that the party was over. So you know, think about it this way: what what options? 
did the parties that were previously committed to embedded liberalism have apart from ending the party right they 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 could have increased taxes maybe to pay f because remember the the thing we have said already and which we must say again is like up until then they could afford to have their cake and eat it too that's been our argument right it wasn't so much that they were tax tax taxing out of some kind of commitment to socialism or something like this they were taxing because they could afford to tax because the economy was doing so well and everyone was making a lot of money um and it was a way of 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 it, it, it was it was a it was a way of getting away from the politics that had led to World War II and the economic relations that had led to World War II and intellectually it made sense economically it made sense and economically it was possible after the 1970s it's not economically possible anymore right so um, you could increase taxes to pay for, to continue to pay for social provision, um, you know, to, to redistribute the wealth, that kind of thing. But it's likely that populations on the whole would have fought back against that. They didn't really want to pay more taxes. So the result was what people call an austerity fiscal regime. And this is what we're talking about from the 1970s onwards. We make a mistake from this point of view, if we think of austerity as something that gets born um, in uh, the context of what happened in 2008. Um, austerity from this point of view is a response to the ongoing capitalist crisis as it intensifies and crops up in the context of stagflation in the 1970s. So what is the European Union do as a response to that? Obviously, we've had the first phase of the European Union as a response to the economic collapse, the collapse nearly of capitalism in the context of the Great Depression. Now, in this new phase of stagflation, we have a new kickoff of the logic of European integration. But this time, it's about something called the Single European Act, which is going to create not just a common market in a limited basket of goods and services, but literally a single market in a full sense, right? Um, where finance, capital, all these sorts of things are going to be able to move around. Banks are going to be able to open branches in different countries, these kinds of things. So a massive political effort um, is, is, is at stake here. It's a huge commitment to try to kick off growth to get back to the kind of growth that characterized Europe in the Trente Glorieuse, as we've been calling them, um, to, um, to, to, to fix the need for austerity, uh, to shake off the curse of stagflation. And, and certainly was a change in tone, but it was, it was a response to the disaster that was going to be articulated in terms of market forces. And it was going to put market forces in the driver's seat. And this is where Danny Roderick's concept of the trilemma potentially becomes useful, as Ben Rosamond argues. Now, who the hell is Danny Roderick? So Danny Roderick is a scholar of development studies. And insofar as that goes, um, he argues that, and you can see here on the diagram on the screen, his contention that um, you can have um, three sort of pillars of any development strategy that is oriented as a response to globalization. You have three basic pillars, and you can have two of them in play at any one time. And those are national sovereignty, economic globalization, and democracy. So it's worth thinking about this for a minute, right? Um, obviously, Bretton Woods was a marriage 
of democratic politics and national sovereignty, right? It was a, uh, a way of using the sovereignty of the nation, again, as a kind of a marriage counselor uh, between um, the logic of the market and um, the logic of democracy. And democracy was sort of managing successfully again because it could be afforded um, to 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 keep the logic of capitalism sort of constrained. But under globalization, after the 1970s, the axis switches to what Roderick calls the golden straight jacket, right? Um, and this is where democratic politics ceases to be able to articulate any kind of restriction, any kind of regulation over globalization, over the logic of the market. And the national sovereignty question begins to basically become not so much a marriage counselor between the economy and democracy, but rather a kind of a foot soldier or a handmaid, uh, might be a better way to put it, um, of the global economy. And many people would sort of contend that when you look at the way Europe today is responding to the refugee crisis, when you look at the dilemma of Brexit, when you look at Donald Trump's tariffs, um, all of these things sort of indicate that or show how in the wake of the end of the Bretton Woods period, it's this golden straitjacket end of things that is strengthening, not the global governance alternative, which we haven't really mentioned yet, but that would be where democratic politics uh, uses global institutions to regulate a proper global economy um, that um, once again uh, has a kind of a marriage counselor effect um, that that constrains the logic of the market such that again these social purposes can be addressed if the nation state can't do it anymore then it can have to be how would have to be done at the global level instead that doesn't seem to be happening instead we seem to be kind of uh, returning to this kind of um, emphasis on the logic of the market and the state seems to be defending that, right? Um, the social purposes are not being uh, addressed. So this is the thing to sort of really register that that we are living in what some people call an era of neoliberalism not embedded liberalism but neoliberalism embedded liberalism took the logic of the market and embedded it in social purposes um neoliberalism is a reassertion of the liberal logic of marketplaces and do not get confused with the Glenn Beck or Fox News version of liberalism here. We're not talking about hippies and tree huggers and Hillary Clinton, right? We're talking about liberal economics, which is the economics of free trade and globalization. So despite the fact then that we think of it as a phenomena of small government, in times of crisis, um, Neoliberalism will, where necessary, turn to the power of the state um, in order to uh, secure the logic of the financial markets. And in this sense, it kind of goes back to what we were saying about Bretton Woods as being kind of an illusion that our parents' generations lived with for a brief while it did look like you could have this perfect marriage um, arranged by a marriage counselor between national sovereignty and democratic politics. And then globalization kind of like 
taking a back seat to all of that. But you could only do it while growth was good. When growth dies, you see what Bretton Woods really was. And you see that now, to maintain growth, elites are more willing to abandon democracy than they are to abandon globalization. And I think this is very evident in the Trump era. Now, of course, on the election trail, Donald Trump talked frequently about bringing jobs back home. And we know he's now putting tariffs on Chinese and European goods to try to encourage U.S. manufacturing. Uh, but be careful about this, because while he's invoking rhetoric that sometimes sounds almost as if it belongs in a Bernie Sanders speech, his actions speak louder than his words. And his nationalism is more focused on keeping out immigrants, I think, than in shutting down financial globalization, so to speak. So to be clear, then, if we're looking again at Danny Roderick's three marriages here, Bernie Sanders, I think, would be more about trying to get back to Bretton Woods, that that marriage uh, between national sovereignty and democratic politics. Trump um, sounds like he's Bretton Woods on good days, but in actual fact, he's still very much two feet squarely in the golden straitjacket of neoliberalism, uh, which is the marriage of globalization and national sovereignty. So we see now that this new nationalist neoliberalism, some people call it authoritarian neoliberalism, is not really a switch away from austerity. Instead, uh, where neoliberalism since the 1970s was about small government, today it seems increasingly to be about bumping up the, power of the powers of the state, especially in terms of military and policing of borders to, to stop economic migration. And I think this is what Trump and the logic of Brexit to a certain extent reflect it's the golden straitjacket but it's the golden straitjacket kind of squared or on overdrive so um if the previous uh, slide addressed uh, the question of um, the death of growth and how we couldn't afford to um, maintain um, the uh, illusion um, of a kind of a, a capitalism that could function as a marriage between the state and democracy. Um, this slide addresses um, what the prioritization of market society has looked like in practice. Um, and to do that, we have to sort of focus on a certain amount of ideological um, content. Ideology, neoliberalism to be specific, neoliberalism as an ideology um, certainly seems like um, a, a philosophy, if you will, that advocates a free market approach to governing the market. But I would argue that it is actually much more than that. It is a theory of governing the whole of society and not just the market. And this is why I mean to say that we need to think about what, what this prioritization of market society looks like in practice. Perhaps a better way to put all this is that to say, is to say that neoliberalism is a theory of governing the whole of society as if society was itself a marketplace. So importantly then, if neoliberalism is a common sense of our time, then it is also shaping our theory of politics, right? It's a philosophy that is an everyday common sense, shaping our theory of politics. And what this means is that it's not just an economic theory. Um, and it begins to make sense to us actually, because many of the leading proponents um, um, of neoliberalism were, in fact, outspoken critics of what they considered to be a number of politically problematic outcomes of the embedded uh, liberal era. Daniel Patrick Moynihan, for example, famously spoke of the idea of unintended consequences, uh, consequences uh, in the sense of negative consequences that he feared would result, for example, from things like positive discrimination. Um, many of the intellectuals like Moynihan uh, in the 60s and 70s were very worried about uh, 
what they sort of consider to be a kind of social licentiousness connected, for example, with the civil rights movement. And some were worried this had turned up um, uh, in Europe as well in the aftermath of major political disruptions like the French student revolt of May 1968. And similarly then, Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan came to power arguing strongly against what they called entitlement mindsets. Thatcher famously now said there was no such thing as society. And of course, that's a strange thing to say, but, but what she meant was that government only has obligations towards individuals, not to societal phenomena like groups or classes. Now, if individuals themselves choose, if they want to be, charitable, for example, to other individuals, then that's fine. That's their free choice. But society has no obligations to look after everyone because society for Thatcher doesn't exist. So indeed then, because government only recognizes individuals in the free market, society can't exist, logically speaking. So the key point, as Rosamond puts it on page 44, is that neoliberalism was, and I quote, a new thinking which presented markets as both technically efficient and normatively appropriate. What does that mean, normatively appropriate? Well, I think what it means is that the market was being argued not just to be a better way or a more efficient way to govern the economy. It was a way of politically governing us, right? It was going to solve some political problems too. So this is the really, really important point about neoliberalism, right? Neoliberalism is a critique of big government, but not just in the name of economic efficiency. It's often presented that way, but it's about much more than that. Neoliberal intellectuals, when you looked at what they were worried about and why they were advocating this, were really responding to what they were seeing in the world around them. I can't understate this. Um, after Paris of 1968, the, the student uprising, after Woodstock and the tune-in dropout LSD and all the rest, the hippies, uh, people like American political scientist Samuel Huntington were writing reports to various government bodies that spoke of what he called an excess of democracy. There was too much democracy um, and that the market shouldn't be um, subjected to constraints that are being uh, put on it by people who make too many demands, right? So there's too much democracy. The, the business community, the markets need to be protected from the demands of people who want too much. So now, instead of economic policy being decided by this kind of marriage counselor operating between democratically elected parliaments and the needs of the marketplace, more power, again, you got to go back to that triangle from um, Danny Roderick, more power was going to be transferred to the globalization access, that is to the non-elected bodies and institutions of the marketplace. In the United States, this is of course the Fed, the Federal Reserve Bank. Um, that's the bank that decides, uh, the, the government's bank, if you will, that sets interest rates. Parliament, you know, Congress doesn't set the interest rates. They're set by a body of experts that are independent um, of Congress and who are unelected. Um, and in the European Union, um, the single European uh, Act is going to give new powers to the Commission. Again, these so-called faceless bureaucrats that are eventually going to operate what um, we know today as the European Central Bank, which is modeled effectively on the German Bundesbank, which uh, is not again not is run by experts it's not democratically controlled so i think we have to be very clear then um the free market tends to sell itself with an ideology that it advertises to us as uh the path to a kind of political freedom but that ideology isn't how it's actually governed. The way it is governed is not a pathway to freedom at all because, well, how could it be? 
it, the, the, the governing institutions that, that, that look after the marketplace today are elitist, technocratic and undemocratic institutions. They, they are institutions run by experts, experts who are not democratically appointed. Um, and this is what Rosamond is saying, I think, on page 45, when he says that neoliberalism accentuated the first of the three ongoing di di dilemmas of European integration. What does he mean by that? He means that a constitutional shift um, happened under neoliberalism um, that had significance for the way market is the market is prioritized in our society. In, in Danny Roderick's terms, in other words, then what, what it means is that globalization is not something that happens to or comes along and just simply undermines state power, like we're sort of like a, like a drive-by shooting or something globalization sort of you know hit us in the face and now we're the victims of globalization that's not the way to think about globalization at all globalization is a marriage of the state and the logic of the markets and in that sense neoliberalism is an anti-democratic or anti-majoritarian whatever you want to call it redeployment of the state linking its capacities not so much to the democratic requirements of the people but to the uh, imperatives of the logic of global markets. And so the key point, says Rosamond on page 45, is that the politics of the present crisis has been played out under the influence of longer standing features of European political development that, while carrying implications for the EU, are not endogenous to the EU. Let's translate that into English. What that means is that the crisis is not something that has happened as a necessary outcome of the configuration of European Union institutions. There are things um, outside of the history of the European Union institutions which are at play here. And I think that that is the history of capitalism's tendency towards crisis. So, says Rosamond, and I think again here invoking Roderick, the key tension now is between a future of technocratic neoliberalism, right? A, a rule-bound monetary order uh, respecting the rules of, of, of market correction um, as opposed to market making, right? Market correction versus market making. In other words, austerity versus stimulus. Um, neoliberalism versus Keynesianism. However you want to frame that to yourself, that's fine by me. Um, so we have this tension then. Uh, we could have a, a new democratic order, perhaps one that is orchestrated on a global level. Um, uh, some would call it an alternative globalization or a democratic globalization. But right now we're nowhere near that. What seems to be happening is that we're doubling down on the logic of market correction. We're producing this very state-embedded um, uh, or, or, or uh, yeah, state embedded um, version of neoliberalism, um, which seems very, very determined to um, use the power of the state, the capacity of the state to protect, to police, um, perhaps even militarize um, the borders of the world in order to defend the status quo. So our last slide for uh, this lecture then um, just uh, brings us neatly to someone we've been reading in class, Peter Mayer and his book, Ruling the Void. Um, the thing to say here really is that um, all of this that we've been talking about, the advent of neoliberalism, the end of the post-war compact because of the collapse of growth, all of this has um, put our political parties in a very difficult position. The post-war parties, sometimes they were to the right, sometimes they were to the left, but all of them were committed to uh, the marriage counselor approach uh, between the logic of the marketplace and the demands of the masses, right? And for this reason, they were known as mass parties because they represented actual uh, 
segments of society, vast segments of society. Today, since the 1970s especially, we've seen a decline of this uh, commitment to uh, that marriage counselor approach. And it's a, a decline that has uh, affected the center left or social democratic parties especially. Today we have fewer parties um, trying to catch multiple segments. And so um, these are known now as catch-all parties, right? Um, and and uh, that, that might sound complex, but think about the American setup, right? You know, it, it, America has always been a two-party system. But I think it's very, very clear, for example, looking at the Republicans and looking at the Democrats today, that they're straining under the the burden of trying to contain, you know, on the Democratic side, the Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders wing, and on the Republican side, the Trump kind of more far right wing and the sort of Eisenhower slash uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger sort of old school industrial Republican model that's still there. And of course, you still have you have Christian conservatives to, to contend with in there as well. So there's a lot of sort of um, different tendencies struggling to to fit in within within parties. And, and that's increasingly the case in Europe, I think, as well. Um, and why is that important? Well, a great example of this in Europe is the British Labour Party. Um, the British Labour Party under Tony Blair, especially, um, Tony Blair was a leader, um, elected on a massive mandate to implement what was known as a third way ideology. But the British Labour Party traditionally is a very left wing party. So Blair, as the elected leader of the British Labour Party, and an advocate of the third way position was kind of seen as an Arabist within the British Labour Party because he didn't respect the traditions of that party. He didn't respect the traditional segments that um, that party was was appealing to. Now the Labour Party was going to encompass third way neoliberals as well as you know those more traditional socialist tendencies. So this causes a breakdown in the way the European parties are functioning. The classic post-war view of the party, again, was this as this marriage counselor, or this mediator uh, between the different sides, uh, between the economic side and the democratic side. Um, and this gave that party a particular kind of legitimacy, where it was seen that it could actually fight for the social segments it claimed to be able to rec represent. It could do so credibly, and it could show results for its efforts over time, which gave voters the impression that these parties were honest brokers when it came to define the limits of what a society could or could not do, right? How it could spend its sort of social resources, so to speak. And so what this means, as Peter Mayer argues, is that the parties, the old mass parties, had social standing. They were able to call the shots because they had social capital in the bank, so to speak. They had credit in the bank, goodwill in the bank uh, with their voters. They were able then to go back to those voters and call certain shots on balancing legitimacy and technical reason. Today, says Mayer, parties are nothing like that anymore. The legitimacy thing has gone out the window. They don't care about social capital anymore. Today, says Mayor, they are cartels. They are machines, election winning machines. Um, think of them really, they're much more like competing brands of cola than they are political parties. You know, they're very hard to tell apart. They, they are big tent organizations. The Republicans and the Democrats, when you look at them in the United States, are, are you know, really quite hard to tell apart most days of the week, right? Um, there's little daylight between them. Um, you know, in a, in a blind taste test, you might not be able to distinguish between them, and that's the point there. So the cartel party is, a, is, is different to the mass party. It's, um, it's, it's a much different beast altogether. Um, 
so variations on the same theme basically variations on the theme of the status quo avoiding too much change and ultimately what emerges from our analysis of these parties is that they're kind of elitist they all accept whether they are liberal or whether they are conservative the core notion that the market is the source of all wealth and all happiness and that the market must be preserved at all costs and the upshot really here for us at the end of our conversation today is whether liberal or conservative their market orientation means that they're not in any position either of them to resist the logic of, of austerity and the, the the danger here is that because those big parties can't do that it's made space available for more extremist forms of politics to emerge um, and namely of course what i mean there is potentially the far right as you can see ongoing today in hungary and other places around europe um, in, and also in the lot in britain in the in terms of the fact that Nigel Farage and people like him are advocating for things like Brexit. Um, so that's it, guys. That's the end of our uh, show for today. Thanks for joining me. Uh, I hope this was helpful. Um, 